I'm Walter Van Michaels. I'm a, ordinarily a professor of English, but uh, by night I'm the interim dean of the College of Architecture, Design, and the Arts um, here at UIC. And I want to begin by welcoming you to the Otto and Marlis Cohen Symposium, Public Performances, the Arts and Politics of Architecture. And the occasion for this event is, in part, the competition to design a new performing arts center for the college. And we're very pleased to welcome principals from all three of our teams to our discussion today. But our hope is to use this occasion to begin thinking about the public today, about public architecture and public education, at a moment when the very idea of the public as just emblemized in those institutions, architecture and education, is under attack. And when public research universities serve more to reproduce class stratification than to mitigate it. The median family income of students at Michigan, where I was very briefly a student in the late 1960s, because um, it sort of was the 60s, um, is $154,000. And at UC Berkeley, where I actually taught for many years, because uh, it wasn't the 60s any longer, it's $120,000. Essentially, the 120 is twice the median income, median family income, in the United States. It's in this context that we've convened this event, trying to think about what role architecture may have played in getting us into this predicament, and what role it might play in getting us out of it. And we do so at a university that is, with respect to these issues, something of an outlier. If you um, look at the left slide in front of you, you'll see the universities whose research expenditures look most like ours. Research, research expenditure is actually not a very good way of measuring intellectual ambition, but it'll do for today. If you look on the right, you'll see universities who admit many first-year students on Pell Grants, that is to say, they admit poor kids. If you then ask yourself, which universities try to do both? That is, which universities have the commitment to research embodied on one side and the commitment to uh, educating students who otherwise don't have access to that research on the other? If you look, in other words, at both of them, achieving the kind of intellectual quality associated with the research money while educating students, many of whom have basically no money, you'll see what I mean by outlier. The only two universities in the country that have both those ambitions are UIC and the University of California at Irvine. And actually, although I haven't quite got it in front of me, my memory of that slide, and I can see it from here, is that in the last few years, as UC Irvine's research ambitions have continued apace, their admission of kids on Pell Grants has declined. Why are there so few universities with this mission? The most ambitious intellectual work for all students, not just for rich ones. Because in our society, that's basically a self-contradiction. Rich universities teach rich students, which is what keeps them both rich and makes the research possible. Poor universities teach poor students with the same effect, only inverted. So UIC's attempt to refuse this imperative and to, in effect, live this contradiction makes things both interesting for us and difficult, since if we're not feeling the contradiction sting, that is, if we're not feeling the problem of what it means to maintain those research ambitions, but to do so for a student body, which is precisely not the wealthy student body of our competitors. If we're not feeling the contradiction sting, we're not doing our jobs. Today's conference is a part of this effort. I think of our subject not really as the social responsibility of architecture. It's my experience in my own work, which is mainly on uh, literature and photography. But the minute you start talking about the social responsibility of any art, um, it has a completely deadening effect. This is actually, if you turn things around and start talking about the aesthetic ambitions of any art without thinking of its social formation and function, that has an equally deadening effect. So I think of our subject not really as the social responsibility of architecture, and it's for sure not about the social responsibility of buildings. No building can change the relation between labor and capital. I think it's more about the intellectual ambition of architecture, both how both as a building practice and as a, as a discursive one, architecture can help us think about reimagining, 
revising, and then perhaps rebuilding the idea of the public. Good morning. I'm Judith DeYoung. I'm an architecture faculty member and associate dean of CATA. Um, I wanted to talk very briefly about our campus because uh, the architecture and urban design of our campus is very much embodies the urban public mission um, of the public university. Um, some of you are familiar with this backstory, but it's always a good uh, reminder of where we came from and where we are. So UIC was conceived um, as a proximate four-year public alternative for residents of Chicago, uh, thereby providing affordable educational opportunities to a much wider audience of students. Uh, the site for the new campus, as you see here, was adjacent to rail, major highways in downtown Chicago, which of course provided easy access for commuters. There was no residential um, aspect of the campus. Everybody commuted. Um, the site, however, was also deeply contested by its previous residents uh, who were ro re relocated through urban renewal. Um, rather than mimic the pastoral forms of the traditionally rural public university, the model of which, of course, is the University of Virginia by Thomas Jefferson, the kind of ur-American campus, um, Netch and his team from Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill sought to materialize a new expression of public education through urban and architectural design. Um, this is their initial diagram of the campus, um, showing that the campus was conceptualized as a pebble dropped in a pond, also known as the drop of water scheme, which represented knowledge spreading out. Um, the dense inner rings of campus contained the shared lecture halls and classroom buildings, flanked by the library and student union, while the outer rings contained discipline-specific buildings. Um, because this was a commuter campus, parking was indicated by the yellow outlined boxes. Uh, we also see this in an early model. Um, just a couple notes. So we're basically above the highway looking west. That big white thing in the background that looks kind of like a giant roof is actually a sign. It's like when you walked up to the model, it was the sign that said, this is the model of the University of Illinois at Chicago. So it's not a building, <laughs> even though it kind of looks like one. But what you see in the model is this dense uh, center. And as it spreads out into the discipline-specific buildings, including UH, and our building on the corner there in its uh, original proposed um, form. Um, and then here we see that in some of the initial photographs taken of the campus just before it opened, uh, that dense collective center. Um, the campus was connected throughout by raised walkways, human highways designed for a projected enrollment of 32,000 students within five years. That obviously didn't happen. Um, and these came together in a great public amphitheater called the Circle Forum, which was at the literal and conceptual center. The amphitheater and its exedras, which are those um, smaller collective spaces on the corners, were modeled after ancient Greek amphitheaters for their performative qualities. These were spaces for literal performance of arts, of politics, and then just for hanging out. Um, and here's a, obviously a view from above and a view from inside the Circle Forum. Um, buildings were also carefully arranged to shape uh, urban parks and plazas for public student life across the site. Uh, in an interview with the UIC historian, Netch characterized the landscape as, quote, an urban park for an urban campus, for an urban environment, for an urban program. Um, as you've seen in these past few images, including this one, most campus buildings were designed as rectangular forms with exposed concrete structural frames filled with exterior walls of brick, precast concrete, and or glass. But Netch's final buildings, uh, of which this is one, the Architecture and Art Building, um, the Behavioral Sciences Building, and the Science and Engineering South Building were a dramatic formal shift. While materially similar to earlier buildings, Netch was now experimenting with what Bob Brugman characterizes as a new, quote, highly ambitious rotated geometry that he called field theory as a way to enrich the basic geometries of architectural modernism. You see this in the model, again, the complete model of our building, and then the 40% that was built. Uh, field theory was a three-dimensional geometry based on the double helix of DNA, which Netsch called the most ex amazing scientific discovery of the 20th century. And in his oral history at the Art Institute, he situated his use of it within a larger history of geometry and architecture, quote, the way the Gothicists used geometry or the Greeks used geometry. So what you see here is a drawing, um, it's a schematic or diagrammatic drawing of our building showing the way the square was rotated and then arrayed. 
to develop the overall shape of our building and the space in between, which is highlighted here, um, was the kind of uh, spiraling DNA-like helix of circulation. You see the little axonometric down in the corner. Um, obviously, only 40% of our building was built, so you don't get that full understanding. But this was the first uh, field theory building. The second one was BSB. We see the next step in this um, evolution. The size of the geometry, is, the size of the squares is much smaller. It's much more highly articulated and plastic. So this is a view looking down from UH and a view looking back across towards UH and you see the kind of highly articulated facade. Um, SES was the third one. Um, the thing that's uh, new in this one is that he's, um, he, the elevated walkway lands in a shared exterior court from which you then enter the building. So he's experimenting now with these kind of outdoor plazas. Um, field theory also produced particularly impactful public spaces throughout the interiors of buildings. Uh, corridors widened into large galleries and pinup spaces. This is upstairs in our building. Stairs became amphitheaters and roofs became classrooms. They don't let us do this anymore. Um, Netsch expressed the importance of art and architecture to the university and the city by using field theory for the architecture and art building and by locating it on the campus's most prominent corner near the highway interchange. As I've said, only 40% was built and the remainder of the corner site was used as a parking lot rather than a public space. And when dormitories were built along Harrison and Halstead, the conceptual and spatial qualities of the corner were further compromised. Um, the importance of the arts uh, was underscored in a little known speculative project called Project Y. Uh, Natch actually, in his oral history, actually calls this a secret project. Um, I don't think it was secret, but it's, it certainly wasn't particularly well known. Um, this was a massive complex. This is, I, I think this is at least eight blocks of the West Loop. <laughs> So imagine crossing over, so this is, he's basically using the Peoria Street Bridge as an extension of the elevated walkways. And as you see here, it lands in a central plaza. And so you see the next step in the thinking of field theory from SCS to here. It's lined with an arcade of glass topped um, shapes. And then it's lined with four theaters. Uh, let's see, four theaters recital hall, music, drama, and dance education spaces, and an art museum. Um, and he characterized the complex as, quote, an equivalent of Lincoln Center to Chicago. Um, in the 1990s, the campus was irrevocably transformed by the removal of the walkways in the Central Amphitheater. Uh, reasons for the demolition range from a lack of maintenance to a lack of accessibility to a perception of danger to a complaint that the campus wasn't green enough. Um, each of these concerns was solvable but the university lacked the political will to do so. A couple notes on this image. Obviously, we're in the air looking back towards the city. Uh, you see our building, and immediately to the left, you see the old ComEd site. So ComEd's electrical substations were here prior to the campus, and so one of the first things that happened was the wall was built around that ComEd site, and then th that was the one stretch, this one stretch of steel bridge um, that spanned that. Um, so recently, after many years of minimal maintenance, uh, University Hall's facade was properly restored. At the same time, ComEd finally left its site, which was subsequently remediated and now belongs to UIC, which recuperated the access between our building and UH, which was once only available via that bridge. Um, it has also exposed our building in a previously unseen way. Um, and created a new public space for our public university. And I would argue that what all of these projects do is reaffirm our campus's continuing importance as a symbol of the urban public mission of UIC. Uh, welcome to the School of Architecture, uh, the third of a series of welcomes. Uh, as someone once said, you know, Everything's been said already, but not by everybody who has to say it, so um, that's my role. Um, thank you for coming. Also want to thank everyone in the School of Architecture office, uh, in particular Adrian and Gwen, 
Jane, Carly, Jason, uh, and all the other students and faculty who have assisted with the project, and also especially to um, my collaborators, Judith and Walter, in particular, for really establishing the motive and means of the event, <laughs> um, for which it would not happen in any other way uh, without that. Um, when we got together to really think about how could we set off, you know, in conjunction with this competition, uh, which had been previously called, of course, a Performing Arts Center, which is now a Center for the Arts. Uh, as it became a reality, we figured we also wanted to do something that had sort of intellectual content alongside with it and to smuggle some in like a Trojan horse, get some ideas in also um, with an exciting project. Um, so we wanted to really set this up as some larger discussions around such an endeavor or even in excess of such an endeavor. Um, and our idea really off the bat was to look at the intersection or the transactions, let's say, between performance and architecture, or specifically the multiple ways in which performance can and has been thought through architecture as a political, technical, and aesthetic possibility. In one sense, then, in the first sense, maybe uh, to see architecture as a performative, in other words, as a form of enactment. Um, this can be seen even in the most banal and professional sense, you could say, in the sense of working drawings, uh, which is a great phrase, um, not to be confused with those lazy idle drawings that are hanging out, these are working drawings, um, or also contract documents. Um, in other words, these are representations in and of themselves that issue instructions for performance by others. Uh, they set out legal obligations, uh, they are a contract to make things happen. So these are sort of everyday forms of really the extraordinary power of how to realize or materialize the imaginary or the fantasy. Um, in that sense, every act of architecture more broadly seems to be a constitutional moment. Uh, we are the people or we the people moment. An assertion that immediately takes on the status of what it names which is also why architecture seems to be always in a perpetual state of constitutional crisis, returning to first principles, deviating from precedents, and asserting new central foundations. The second sense of performance uh, is a sense of what architecture does most uh, sort of directly, how it performs, how it delivers and satisfies myriad technical, material, environmental, urban, economic, and social demands all of which are increasingly governed by and evaluated by uh, their measurable impacts and tolerances. We're all obligated in some way to the bottom line, to what is also quaintly called performance-based budgeting, for example. The third sense of performance uh, is really setting the stage for others to do things. Architecture, in this sense, is really a kind of instrument or a score um, which can be played differently by various individuals and groups. As a stage, architecture is also a site where architecture itself can reenact its past as a way of rehearsing a possible future. So these three senses of performance, crudely the political or programmatic, the technical or environmental, and the aesthetic or theatrical, set up in some sense the three-part structure of the panels, though we don't really expect anyone to fulfill or play those roles. <laughs> so it's, we're already off script. <laughs> um, but I think that you know, underlying this discussion, of course, there's a longer history uh, of the mutual involvement of architecture and performance, particularly powerful and pervasive in the late 60s and early 70s, paradox paradoxically a moment when architecture entered its own moments of doubts about its ability to deliver on its social promise. The earlier invocations of performance uh, and the parallel attempt uh, really to liberate time or a theory of event for architecture which had previously been captured by a static idea of space, um, this kind of work, let's say that, you know, I will only mention a couple of names like Rossi and Haydick or Shumi and Lawrence Halperin, um, really uh, many others started as a kind of fictive endeavor 50 years ago. In other words, borrowing strategies from film, theater, dance, happenings, literature. Well, today you could say that increasingly we see performance instead through the data-rich modeling of reality. Um, less a fictive conceit than a kind of model of reality. Um, and so the shift from serving as a conceit to being a condition, I would say, is an important shift 
from that earlier moment and a particular problem for us in a cultural field. Cedric Price famously said or named his talk, uh, technology is the answer, but what was the question? Um, today it seems that vast segments of society, including the contemporary university, that that could be updated to design is the answer, but what was the question? Um, because design and more broadly, I think architecture and the arts, all of those parts that the college uh, represents, has come, to, has come to be a kind of panacea for social institutions to address the world and its woes. The first aspect of this substitution, let's say of design for technology, um, is the ways in which architecture, design, and the arts have been instrumentalized today. Our cities and our cultural and political institutions, not least of all our universities, expect architecture, design, and the arts to be the public face of the organization, to instantiate innovation, creativity, to demonstrate impact and engagement, to engender identity and brand recognition, to increase enrollments and revenues, to reduce cost and energy use, and so on. To the degree that architecture operates as a cultural endeavor, it's important not simply to satisfy those demands and expectations, but sometimes to frustrate or defer them, sometimes to set off new desires, or imagine an alternative set of criteria. In other words, how can we use one kind of performance to offset another kind of performance? Um, unlike building, I would say, architecture has to always keep a double set of books. It has to do what's asked of it, but never what's expected of it. Which is to say, when you ask an architect or architecture to do something for you, you have no idea what you're asking for. Um, um, so regardless of whether any of the panels narrowly engage the specific sense of performance we imagined, I assume the discussion will circulate around how we establish and play on the border or the boundary between a series of contradictions or antinomies. In other words, between public and private, between individual and collective, movement and constraint, or freedom and security, between the campus and the city, between inside and outside, nature and artifice, as well as between author and audience or participant and spectator. In other words, how architecture and its allied practices might script, screen, and stage those patterns and relationships. Architecture as a discipline and a practice is one of the privileged forms society takes in negotiating and renegotiating those borders. That's its value, which should not be confused with or captured by the narrow accounting practices of other domains. In other words, it's not simply that architecture is a public performance by virtue of its size, its expense, or its visibility, its longevity, or the numbers of people that are necessary to mobilize and script in order to realize and maintain it, but because architecture establishes the precondition for or constitutes the po possibility of any public or any performance at all. So the format for today um, uh, is that each participant on the panel will have 15, up to 15 minutes um, to present their polemic or uh, argument or presentation. And that will be followed by a discussion, which is really meant in the sense of an open seminar. So uh, what we expect and hope for is a kind of active involvement from not only the particular participants on stage, but all of those who are momentarily in the audience and in fact the rest of you we will have a mobile mic uh, to record it for posterity. Um, I would say there's no party line here at this event. Uh, we expect a discussion and debate around these issues uh, among ourselves and with you. Uh, I am pretty sure that will happen because uh, when I look around the room, I realize I get the impression that what this is is really a gathering of contrarians anonymous. So I have no doubt that people will disagree with each other and probably even with themselves. Um, so we welcome spontaneous outbursts of indignation and disagreement whenever possible. Um, uh, but you have to call for a microphone first um, uh, because it's not that spontaneous. Um, so I think with that we will convene our first panel and then I will welcome our guests from the table. I will not belabor the introductions, um, but I will, in order of presentations, uh, we have Kenneth Warren, who is a distinguished service professor uh, at the University of Chicago um, in the Department of English, uh, author of What Was African American Literature, among other things. Um, very happy to have Ken here. 
second will be Christine Marie Dunford, Christine Mary Dunford. <laughs> For me, Christine. Um, I understand the stage name confusion. You need three names because, yeah, <coughs> others. Oh, my name and union. Sure. <laughs> no, a union thing. Um, Christine is the director of the School of Theater and Music uh, and also a member of Looking Glass uh, Company and uh, also uh, kind of anthropologist, ethnographer, as well as an actress, director, and writer. Um, Sanford Quinter, who you will see, not see. <laughs> Uh, Sanford is in an Uber, apparently, because Sanford is very theatrical and performative and will have to walk in on cue. <laughs> um, and if Sanford from Pratt does not walk in on cue, uh, we will immediately shift to uh, Shohei uh, Shigematsu, who is uh, one of our uh, three competitors uh, for, the, for the Performing Arts Center, for the C Center for the Arts. Uh, Shohei is a partner at OMA New York, uh, and a long time uh, sort of collaborator and friend of ours uh, in the school. So um, welcome all three and we'll start with Ken. Okay, good morning. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Walter for inviting me to uh, uh, join this uh, uh, panel and the, the event today, although I feel very much like a fish out of water. Uh, um, and though I'm no stranger to the idea of uh, polemic, I, my remarks today I don't think uh, fall under that, uh, that heading, but I thought that by way of taking up the, I guess, subtitle, um, Architecture After Identity, I would decided to do something um, a little bit out of the way, um, but I hope to the point by thinking of architecture under democracy um, and to return uh, to the late 19th century with Henry James, who was a, <coughs> among other things, um, a persistent thinker about the, um, <coughs> the fate of uh, the arts under um, uh, the, um, the thought or the idea of democracy. So I'll begin <coughs> by quoting a bit from an 1886 story uh, that James wrote titled The Point of View. Uh, the story <coughs> excuse me, uh, comprises a series of unanswered letters from various correspondents, uh, some of them U.S. citizens, uh, some Europeans, who've just arrived in the United States um, and they uh, in which they comp uh, convey their various uh, comparative sentiments about the United States and Europe. Uh, and the object of inquiry in these various letters is indeed American democracy, such as it was in the late 1880s. And the observations and impressions um, in, the, in, in the letters range from the uh, celebratory to the scandalized. As is often the case with James, questions about democracy become questions about whether or not a putatively, putatively democratic society could produce art or distinctive forms of any kind. And despite James's use of the definite article in the story's title, the point of view, the tale produces no consensus about its object, or rather to the extent that any of the letter writers do agree on any aspect of that subject, the reactions evoked by it differ markedly from one another. In one instance, uh, for example, a decidedly out of sorts French academician, Monsieur Lejeune, offers up a series of jaundiced observations on what he has seen in his travels, um, noting that from his train car there are windows in the wagons, he says, enormous like everything else, but there is nothing to see. The country is a void. No features, no objects, no details, nothing to show you that you are in one place more than another. Well, see, you are not in one place, you are everywhere, anywhere. The train goes 100 miles an hour, the cities are all the same, little houses, 10 feet high, or, less, or else big ones, 200. Tramways, telegraph poles, enormous signs, holes in the pavement, at Chicago, right? Oceans of mud, young ladies looking for the husband. On the other hand, no, no beggars, no cocottes, none at least that you see, a colossal mediocrity, except, my brother-in-law tells me, in the machinery which is magnificent. Naturally, no architecture. They make houses of wood and of iron. No art, no literature, no theater. I have opened up some of the books. They're not worth reading. No form, no matter, no style, no general ideas. They seem to be written for children and young ladies. Now, the dominant tone, of course, here is that of formlessness, 
uh, formlessness somewhat paradoxically produced by uniformity, everything everywhere the same, and the abiding, abiding value is that of domesticity. There is an absence of anything that gives off any sense of what might be called the sublime. But as I've said, the story pre presents us with multiple points of view. And in contrast to the Frenchman's Lament are, among other ones, the observations of a young, brash Philadelphian by the name of Marcellus Cockerell, whose surname attests to his penchant for crowing about the virtues of his native land. In a letter addressed to his sister, in which he rejoices in his visit to Washington, D.C. after a vacation abroad, he notes some of the same features of the American social scene that were noticed by the Frenchman. For example, he agrees that there is a, something like a lack of distinction, that there's a lack of extremes, of extraordinary poverty. Um, but unlike the Frenchman, Cockerell is not at all dismayed by what is not there, or, or what is, say, not yet there, which is to say he doesn't doubt the eventual development of an American high style, but even more striking is how deeply impressive he finds what he does see on the scene as it exists um, at the moment of his arrival. He writes in a letter to his sister, disparaging, first of all, what he takes to be the um, um, vices of the um, aristocratic classes in Europe, there is no regular wife-beating class. And there are none of the stultified peasants of whom it takes so many to make a European noble. The people here are more conscious, conscience of, conscious of things. They invent, they act, they answer for themselves. They are not, I speak of social matters, tied up by authority and precedent, we shall have all the Titians by and by, and we shall move over a few cathedrals. You had better stay here if you want to have the best. Of course, I am a roaring Yankee, but you, you'll call me that if I say the least, so I may as well take my ease and say the most. Washington is a most interesting place, and here, at least at the seat of government, one isn't over-governed. In fact, there's no government at all to speak of. And it seems too good to be true. The first day I was here, I went to the Capitol, and it took me ever so long to figure to myself that I had as good a right there as anyone else. That the whole magnificent pile, it is magnificent, by the way, was in fact my own. In Europe, one doesn't rise to such conceptions. My spirit had been broken in Europe. The doors were gaping wide. I walked all about. There were no, do no doorkeepers, no officers, nor flunkies not even a policeman to be seen. It seems strange not to see a uniform, if only as a patch of color. But this isn't government by liver livery. The absence of these things is odd at first. You seem to miss something, to fancy the machine has stopped. It hasn't, though. It only works without fire and smoke. At the end of three days, this simple negative impression, the fact is that there are no soldiers, no spies, nothing but plain black coats, begins to affect the imagination, becomes vivid, majestic, symbolic. It ends up be, being more impressive than the biggest view I saw in Germany. Of course, I am a roaring Yankee, but one has to take a big brush to copy a big model. Now, the agreement between Lejeune and Cockerell that deep social and personal vice are largely missing from the American scene might, in another con context, merit more extended commentary. Um, and neither observer is cognizant of those who might not be welcomed inside the um, scenes that they observe. But let it suffice here to chalk this perception, however erroneous it might be, up to the commonplace observation that the predominance of the common man and woman was the most significant social fact of American society of the late 19th century. Um, but as I, I pointed out in, in introducing Cockrell's observations, while he does believe that eventually Americans will either produce or import, essentially buy, the architectural masterworks uh, that um, uh, distinguish Europe at, the, at, the, at that moment, what chiefly interests him is what is there already, the magnificent pile that is the array of public buildings that insist on no ceremony and don't in any way keep one out. 
public in this instance means the state without the apparent apparatus, particularly in terms of its police power of the state, to daunt the individual. The undifferentiated public in plain black coats perambulating inside the magnificent pile becomes on Cockrell ac Cockrell's account vivid, majestic, and symbolic. Now, while one can't identify any of the particular points of view in the story fully with that of James, there is in Cockrell's exultation of unimpeded access into public buildings a decided echo of James's own account of his impressions upon entering New York's uh, City Hall when he returned to the States after an absence of more than two decades. Reiterating Cockrell's sense of having had his spirit broken in Europe, James describes himself affronting his, this charming old building um, um, with the obvious fact that the simplest, he says, way to affront it was obviously just to pass under the charming portico and brave the consequences. Didn't know if he could enter, or was he welcome? Just walk right in. This impunity of such audacities being in America, one of the last of the lessons the repatriated absentee finds himself learning. The crushed spirit, and here he's very much echoing uh, Cockerell's words, he brings back from the European discipline, never quite rises to the height of the native argument, the brave sense that the public, the civic building, is his very own for any honest use, so that he may tread even in its most expensive pavements and staircases, and he, he notes parenthetically, very expensive for the American citizen these lately have become, without a question asked. While James does go on to observe that if station sentinels are bad for the temper of the freeman, they are good for the prestige of the building, his recollection of his visit to City Hall luxuriates in a decidedly erotic sense of being inside. He says, this further and further unchallenged penetration begets, begets in the perverted person I speak of, that is the European um, daunted um, American, um, a, I speak of a really romantic thrill. It is like some assault of the dim, uh, on the dim seraglio with the garb, guards bribed, the eunuchs drugged, and one's life carried in one's hand. Now, what I want to distill um, by way of just moving to fairly quickly to um, a conclusion from these observations and rem reminiscences are the associations attacked, attached to the idea of access access to public buildings, the power of American architecture. And I think that's the idea that James is working through here, that there is, a, there is an idea of American d democratic architecture on this account, rests in its potential capacity to imbue the citizen with the sense that she should and could go a step farther than she ought without being checked. And on this view, what, is, what was to be distinct about American public architecture was not that it would uh, merely produce monuments for the public, but rather that the buildings within which the business of the public was being conducted would be open to the public even into their deepest recesses. Now, of course, we are in a very different time and place from that in which James and his characters offered up their observations, and the most notable difference is that no public or private building can be indifferent to security. But even so, I'm wondering whether or not there might be something worth preserving in what I will call the unexpected ideal of ex ac access. Unexpected in this sense, because in the instances I've described, neither figure arrives with the expectation of being able to go in as far as they do. And what might be worth thinking about is this ideal of public buildings being built from the standpoint that one without credentials can be taken inside to see the work that goes on there and that the activities they, in, they enclose can on, on occasion be made visible to the visitor on whose behalf the work is being done. Thank you. I too feel a little bit like a fish out of water. Um, but I'm going to be, I'm going to enjoy swimming here for a little while. <laughs> um, today I'm going to tell you a story about a project that I worked on over 10 years ago, for 10 years. 
um, about how and when I learned about the idea or the idea, uh, learned that ideas, ideology, assumptions, and aspirations are mediated by institutions and produced on the landscape and then constructed through use or through imagination. In, the, in this story, the idea, the, my idea, ideologies that I'll be discussing are about nature, particularly urban nature, race, and citizenship. Um, I have worked for over the past 30 years in two primary fields, in the field of theater. I make plays. I started as an actor, once an actor, always an actor, but I also write and direct. Um, and I also, um, a second primary field is anthropology, and I've been a practicing um, urban anthropologist um, for the past, for about 20 years. Um, and then I decided to go back to school and combine these in a field called performance studies that brings together these two and other fields as necessary. Um, and through this work, I've learned a number of things um, that once I learned them seemed self-obvious. Um, and one is that humans, people, we make, um, we find ways to make, to make sense of being in the world. And uh, we find ways to express what we know to negotiate what we know, and then to create new knowledge. And we do this through, through doing, um, through making plays, buildings, stories, symposiums. Um, performance studies is an emerging field. It's a multidisciplinary study of the expression, negotiation, and creation of knowledge, identity, power, ideas, most recently. But I'll talk a little bit about the genealogy of performance studies very broadly. Um, it has a number of different paths, genealogies, but mine is through literature and the idea of performance of literature. Um, and then through anthropology, through thinking about performance in, of, on, with culture. Um, Richard Schechner, Victor Turner, those folks. Um, and then performance studies, the field, um, as I have moved through it, has turned to uh, thinking about all of culture is being performative. They started by exploring events like a Mardi Gras parade, or I think a great dissertation project would be how a city performs its identity to win the Olympics, or how a university performs its identity to win a, a public Obama public library. I'm um, an event. Hot topics over the past 10 years, though, have been about how we perform identity, knowledge, and power, race, class, and gender. When I was doing my work, I deviated from that direction, that trend, by proposing that we, as performance studies scholars, should um, concern ourselves also with not only thinking about embodied experience um, in culture, but thinking about space and place. Um, my work push pushes the limits of performance studies by thinking about all of spaces as being produced and then constructed. Simply, we can quite clearly see relations between practices and theories produced on the landscape. Um, all I proposed at the time, now it's not radical, but then it felt a lot more radical, that all urban nature is produced in particular. Um, this can, in all urban nature productions can be understood as politically charged, highly symbolic public performances that various stakeholders deploy to create and express identity and values and to realize personal, social, economic, and political gain. Some of the theorists that I was in conversation with, you know, I teach acting and, um, and sometimes we, we te I teach theater and sometimes, you know, we get the question, why are we teaching, why are we having 20 year olds play um, Othello and Macbeth? And, and I say one of the reasons we do that is so that those, those questions can be in their bodies and that they can answer them for the rest of their careers. And this is how I think about um, this research. Um, it came to me years ago, but it still, it still stays relevant. I'm continuing to answer these questions. These are some of the theorists that I'm sure most of you are familiar with that um, I started to put myself in conversation with. Um, uh, Desertot, places, practice, space was um, very important to me, and the idea not written here, but by from Elin Diamond that there is a doing and a thing done. And a doing is a, uh, the thing done is the performance, the building, the story, the play, 
um, the doing is what it performatively accomplishes. So if there is a thing done, the thing that should be done, then there are also things being done around that that maybe should not be done. And this starts to in, uh, invite the question of various stakeholders, very pers various perspectives, and how space is produced by a producer who's doing the, th uh, the thing, and then people who construct or use that space and do the thing done, which may or may not be what was uh, anticipated, might not have been what was um, uh, expected when they walked through those walls, those doors, those gates. So um, I, what I also proposed is that ideas, ideologies about, in this case, nature, race, and citizenship are mediated by institutions and then produced on the landscape. And the institutions that I was looking at in my research area which, or this topic, which was urban gardens in North Lawndale, which I'll get into in a little bit, in a little bit. The institutions involved were government, the city of Chicago, um, nonprofit institutions like neighbor space and open lands, and corporate institutions like Holman Square, a uh, development developer. And then individuals, North Lawndale gardeners and their neighbors. And my project was to make visible the invisible connections between the ideologies, institutions, and individuals that authorized and promoted urban community garden projects in some of Chicago's poorest communities. At that time, in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, there was a couple of dominant discourses around nature. Um, it was, one was that, um, one was that uh, nature is a way to solve all social problems. Um, you can see here that this person is claiming that in the hands of energetic urban elders working with those younger generations might, or spending an afternoon in a garden might just save the world. Um, the, another dominant discourse that um, I was proposing is, and very a couple of other people, like uh, Checker, were that nature was a way in to understanding stakeholders' perspectives or how different individuals were constructing spaces, produced spaces. And I propose that spaces are sites of multiply expressed and multiply interpreted performances of the ideologies and the voices of the stakeholders involved in producing them and then constructing them. This is the, this is the site and this is the story. So in, um, I was actually at UIC in the early 2000s getting a master's degree, and I did a field work uh, project with the, over at the Field Museum, and the students there, we were partnered with community organizations to conduct ethnographic research. I was partnered with an organization called Open Lands, or yes, Open Lands, and they wanted me to go to, this is a map of Open Lands and neighbor space gardens, rather, in Chicago, and you see where they're all clustered. They're clustered right around us. That was the first, things that, first thing that I noticed. I thought, why are all these gardens in this neighborhood? But I was tasked with going to collect the stories of these gardeners, which who I were told were largely African-American women in retirement or near retirement um, who had moved up from the South and were gardening like they had done in their childhoods and that they loved gardening and they were gardening to build community capacity. Um, I found, when I got there, however, a very different story. And I, um, I found that gardeners, I entered, I, I came to talk to them. And after talking to them and starting to map their gardens, I realized that the discourses I was getting from, or the stories I was getting from Open Lands and Neighbor Space were very different from what I was getting from the gardeners as I worked with them in their gardens and talked to them. Few gardeners grew, um, oh, they were all supposed to be growing vegetables so they could have affordable food. Gardens, um, Few gardens, uh, few gardeners grew vegetables. Few gardeners actually worked in their gardens. Most of them had deeply ambivalent feelings about gardening. As one gardener said to me, I knew I'd made it when I never had to garden again in my life and where I could purchase a garden, a vegetable at the store. Um, um, all the gardeners welcomed the gardens into the community, but also almost all the gardeners' gardens, the very first thing they put up was a fence. And most of the gardens, many of them, didn't even have any vegetables or even flowers in them. My favorite, one of my favorite gardens was a gravel with tires painted white and then plastic flowers planted in it and a fence. And he was very, very proud of this garden. So rather than interrogate what a garden is, I started to interrogate what do these gardens, how are they 
constructing these gardens in their imagination and what do they mean to them and they were very, very important to them, so why? Um, so I conducted a multi-sided ethnography with about 10, over a period of 10 years with 10, gardeners, 10 gardens, primarily out of 24. I became very close to, to three of the gardeners. This is a breakdown of the community at the time. Um, and this is the sort of, um, this is what was happening in the mid 90s. Um, the gardens came in, the 24 gardens came in as a part of a larger community development project. Um, open lands and neighbor space were the primary change agents, but the Holman Square Development um, Corporation came in. Charles Shaw and Ed Brennan built mixed rate housing on the old Sears site. Most of us know the original Sears and the original Sears Towers over there. That land was laying uh, dormant largely or, or until Charles or uh, Ed Brennan could figure out what to do with it. He had Charles Shaw develop it into Holman Square. The Staines Family Foundation concentrated all of their grant making in North Lawndale for a short amount of time. Um, over a dozen gardens were built, nearly two dozen and neighbor space assumed ownership of the community managed garden land. So here's what I saw when I got there. This is a more developed one, but you can see an American flag, we can see a fence, we can see flowers. The, the plot of vegetables is way, way, way in the back, um, and most of the vegetables were never even harvested. They were planted, but often would be left to rot rather than harvest. Here's another garden. You can see um, there are uh, the, the Two things that we'll see, we'll see fences and we'll see signs um, in all of the gardens. Uh, this is a gazebo, um, grass, um, a pathway, way, way, way in the back again, you'll see some, some vegetables planted behind that gazebo. This is one um, nun who worked in the community and this is uh, the, her church's sign, Central Park Community Garden. This is the only garden that didn't have a fence um, the nonprofit agencies were saying that they needed fences to protect them from th um, theft. None of the gardens were, were actually experienced any theft even before they had fences, and this one never experienced any theft. So I was like, why are we having these fences if they're not to protect against theft? Um, let me just run through this for time. Um, this is Mrs. Williams' um, garden. And this is what she put in the center of hers. I don't know if you can see it. It's a mosaic of her name on the bottom. And she's claiming space um, in, her, in, in her, she's constructing space in her produced garden that was built by neighbor space. Um, and this is what I came to understand that a growing interest in the environment, nature, or greening combined with reduced public support for social welfare programs at that time led institutions interested in positive social change to develop politically possible and ultimately inadequate local and individual level projects like building vacant lot gardens in order to address larger social issues. So for the institutions, community gardens in North Lawndale were a low cost or no cost way to empower or teach urban black Americans from the South to work or volunteer to help themselves and their community. Why did the residents accept this discourse and these gardens when they knew this was not accurate? They, um, they, I proposed that they accepted the gardens in order to tactically perform respectability to protest against a history of systemic racism and stories about their community and a hope for a better future. So um, Mrs. Morris, uh, a gardener, turned to me one time and said, um, when you plant flowers, good will come. And that was what was driving a lot of the activity in the community by all the stakeholders. Um, this notion of good. One of the things that it actually resulted in is um, it realized, it remapped the public, the gardeners were right. It effectively remapped the public, in the public imagination, North, North Lawndale as a community. The mayor had not come to North Lawndale for many, many years. And because of the gardens, um, 
the mayor came to announce the city's Greystone Initiative uh, and held his conference. This is right across the street from the first garden picture that we saw. He leveraged the gardens in order to perform, to acknowledge and perform the idea that North Lawndale was a respectable community and that we could start to invest in it. And my proposal is that the gardens initiated and the work of the gardeners and the gardens initiated this remapping and realized it. Um, my proposal is that we produce the nature on the landscape and then we construct it and reconstruct it and giving, give it meaning. And what we're continuing to do now is to all the stakeholders in North Lawndale and today in our current building project are gonna be, I'll be looking at how we deploy nature in order to realize this, the visions of the different stakeholders involved. Thank you for this opportunity. It was really interesting, the, the nature as the word. Um, I think it's similar where I want to get at today by showing a couple of projects that we are doing now uh, that uh, actually has maybe an open-ended architectural space that can uh, maybe accommodate or instigate performances that are not really prescribed. And I think more and more that demand is increasing, I feel. This is a repertoire of projects we have, but a lot of public realm projects uh, recently kind of arising, but also within art domain, there are many kind of, uh, let's say, programmatic uh, need to accommodate public uh, performance. As you know, we have done uh, IIT uh, Campus Center, which was really capturing the movement of students from dormitory to the buildings and actually creating an art squad, as you can see uh, in black patches, uh, and conceiving a program between the paths, which of course is a one way to conceive a student center and capture uh, the movement as well as defining the program, which I thought maybe is uh, kind of slightly becoming uh, a little uh, too defined to the way, to the level that the program is uh, not really evolving uh, within within the, each path, but in each path itself, of course, the program is evolving because uh, this uh, space is more open-ended. And as you can see, this was already 2004 or seven, I forgot, but uh, the, there was a kind of a pit for computer space, but now, of course, this is no, uh, it's obsolete. Um, now, um, I worked on a, a Milstein Hall, which is a university, a Cornell University's architecture, art, and planning uh, building. It's a studio that was meant to connect uh, the uh, kind of dispersed buildings of the College of Art and uh, Architecture and Planning. So we conceived uh, a, uh, sorry, uh, a mini art squad, we call it, that uh, mimics the art squad, like an open-ended field uh, that is simultaneously a bridge that connects uh, the, uh, uh, the main building versus the studio. Um, and this is the uh, inside. As you can see, it was quite open-ended, no programmatic definition. Hence, as an architect, we could be involved into a kind of pedagogical discussion with, with the uh, university, which was quite interesting. And as you can see, it's quite flexible uh, because all the kind of infrastructure is on the ceiling, so there's nothing on the floor. That means you can uh, ensure the future flexibility. It's like a lab construction. So because it's like conceived as a plaza, there are many activities that is not anticipated uh, uh, as programmed, but of course there are a lot of plays and uh, um, improvised activities within, within the building. I'm sure there are more, but these are the kind of accidentally captured ones. Uh, there are uh, also landscape-like element uh, at the bottom intersecting the box above, which is also giving an opportunity to uh, have more urban activity within a kind of rural campus. Uh, so it's a concrete dome that uh, has, uh, uh, instigates this kind of activities. Uh, it's hard to see, but it says, please no skateboarding, um, because they started skateboarding be even before we took pictures uh, of the completion. Uh, so typically, the, that kind of urban activities didn't really exist in this uh, campus, but uh, as soon as you provide such a thing, uh, uh, it started to uh, accommodate it. Um, 
and the dome itself can also be the public uh, heart. Um, one thing, we also do a, a park itself because as you know, the, the, uh, we call it a highline effect. Uh, highline attracts more people than any buildings now in New York. Uh, and as you know, multiplication, uh, replication of highline-like elements in different municipalities in the world. And we were part of that uh, initiative too in DC that connects Anacostia, which is uh, 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 traditionally a more low income area connecting to a proper DC area. So symbolically, as you know, the bridge actually slopes up to have a clear clearance. We continue that slope uh, and made a cross and symbolically made a plaza in the center. Uh, that means you can actually continue going up and have a great view back to Anacostia or back to uh, DC. Uh, which is for us, it was almost like a, up, uh, a vertically turned um, X of the uh, L'Enfance plan. L'Enfance plan, as you know, is a squeezed X, so, uh, so it's almost making that vertical up and having a kind of a programmatic, uh, loose programmatic definition around the X like Performance Plaza, Cafe, et cetera. So it's more like a Rialto bridge, but a little bit more kind of wilder. So you can have performance in the bridge and also uh, some kind of nature uh, in the park that uh, of course is a bridge park, so it's a park, uh, which is quite close to a Pentagon, so it might be seen from Air Force One. Uh, <laughs> or it could be a monument of DC, which is quite thin, so we thought the only way to get to a monument status is to claim its uh, X as a 10, uh, so $10 bill. <laughs> anyway, um, the creative economy is something that is for us a, a problematic one, is something that we are monitoring for a while because creative economy is now can be monetized. Uh, as you can see, it's $630 billion. Um, that means there are a lot of uh, uh, side effects based on that monetized uh, meaning of creative creativity. Of course, creativity can truly never be moneti monetized, uh, we think. But for example, this is a UNESCO's Creative City Network. They have, there are 180 uh, cities that are designated, like City of Design, City of uh, uh, Crafts and Folk Art, Literature, Music, anything. Basically, UNESCO is giving those titles to each cities. If you see the designation, history of designation in 2016, from 2014 started to give more and more, like more than 30 cities per year, uh, which uh, we find it very uh, kind of alarming because if you project this to the future, like by 2025, uh, you will have 423 creative cities in the world. That means like, you, you never know what creative means uh, at that point. Uh, what where I'm leading up to is where the cultural planning emerges from this kind of monetized notion of creativity because these kind of uh, lords uh, cultural resource, a soft power a textbook actually is distributed to municipalities that gives a checklist to become uh, a creative city. So it's a kind of cookie cutter uh, um, way of producing cultural uh, cities or uh, creative cities, which uh, generates uh, cookie cutter events, such as art events. So I was very interested in this, so I did the uh, uh, research at Columbia of per, uh, per perennials. So this is amount of uh, biennials that exist in the, in the world currently, 196. Uh, that means in a given uh, let's say 2017, September, there are 19 uh, biennials happening at the same time in the world. That means like everyone is shifting to this kind of art events, which art fairs are now even dominating the attendance over museums. So this is my theory that in 90s and uh, early 2000s, it was a kind of Bilbao effect. Municipalities spending very so much money on uh, iconic structure, but now a lot of municipalities are going for tents, which uh, is quite alarming as an architect how uh, this shift is radically happening. Also, the tent overscales uh, one of the bi uh, biggest museums, but the the experience you get in art fairs, as you know, is quite uh, generic and quite. 
uh, uh, yeah, generic. So it's also kind of alarming because architecture architects are not really involved in the planning and the experience making of this. So in Miami Beach, I had an opportunity to create a, a ballroom attached to a, a, a hotel, but because Miami Beach is now becoming one of the art hub art hubs, uh, thanks to the Art Basel, we pitched that this building will not be just a, a, a ballroom, but it's a kind of, uh, a machine of events that can house uh, different uh, types of event that is required for the art events. Uh, so one is a cube, one is a cylinder that has distinct uh, section and plan that could be used in simultaneously or as one as uh, one big hall together. So this is one in a domed, and this is one in the um, black box. Um, so we thought this uh, kind of open-ended space, again, non-programmed space, is uh, quite well used nowadays uh, because of the, the, this hunger for uh, gathering and events. And I think that's uh, something that architecture is more and more required to have uh, beyond, of course, you have to fulfill the given program, but also provide some uh, a breathing space to uh, achieve um, um, the demand of the uh, performance, public performance. This is the last project I want to show you, is the Quebec uh, National Museum, which was existing, museum was here. They bought a site that is finally attached to a uh, uh, main boulevard of the city. Uh, the new, new building was going to be connected to a church and the former prison, which is, of course, a dream as an architect to do a building that is connected to a prison and the church. And the, this, this was uh, how we diagram. So th because it was sitting on the edge of park in the city, it's not only the museum extends, but the par both park and the city also extends, and art becomes a catalyst between the two. So you can see that the uh, topography goes up to the building, and then the uh, city comes under. Uh, so this is how it's finished. What's interesting about Canadian Museum is that they have funded, they have a fund from the government, half is covered, but half they have to generate by, by themselves. That means the building becomes uh, an event space itself. So we were required to have designed this column-free street-like, uh, street plaza-like space on the ground level that is connected to this uh, street. Uh, sandwiched by different program like cafe and uh, uh, shop and the courtyard, etc., uh, which is this, that becomes a highly uh, public uh, uh, space. So it's really functioning almost like an event space uh, rather than a, a, an, an art museum, but the art is above uh, this kind of public domain. And then you lead people up to the museum through this kind of iconic stair. Hence, the building changes from very sober to more uh, kind of event uh, machine. Uh, because it's uh, Chicago, I want to show you this uh, project uh, that was supposed to be uh, a kind of a beacon uh, for Chicago. Uh, George Lucas was trying to do this kind of building in California, in San Francisco, which was turned down. So he came to Chicago. You know why. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the site was here. Uh, next to the, the soldier field, uh, this kind of, of course, if you don't see, if you see it in normal s a circumstance, it's kind of dead space, but as you know, it was a kind of tailgating heaven. Um, it was a strange competition because just be even before we started do the competition, uh, the, this kind of uh, issue was already in the press. That means we were, we were designing simultaneously and resolving the issue that he was having with the public. Uh, so this is uh, uh, people already protesting, quoting uh, Burnham's. Uh, the site was quite big. This is Louvre, uh, so you could have built uh, actually uh, as big as uh, Louvre. Uh, the program was quite diverse uh, with fashion, costume, digital art, etc., and a lot of big visitor service. We did a lot of studies, for example, making almost like a mimicking a stadium-like uh, museum or a linear museum that connects the McCormick uh, Center and then the uh, uh, stadium. Or the bridge itself, it's hard to see, but bridge itself be in the museum. 
But in the end, we decided to lift the whole gallery to preserve as much uh, public space as possible on the ground so that tailgating gets no comprom uh, get, doesn't get compromised. So it's a gallery space and a vertical a core and a vertical gallery that defines the building, and then an ETFE dome that creates a winter garden above the gallery. So you uh, basically don't compromise any public space. So that creates this kind of mushroom-like uh, museum. And then this was simulating how this building can still allow tailgating or even a kind of uh, uh, driving cinema. Uh, etc. And then a vertical uh, exhibition space. Uh, and to have uh, this kind of multiplied uh, public garden above where you have a great view obviously again again and this is the third space that uh, is not programmed but uh, to give it uh, to a public and for the improvisation and also additional gallery or exhibition space so uh, this is no um, sound unfortunately but this is a film that we presented to George Lucas <laughs> and of course he was quite critical uh, <laughs> Challenging as an architect, uh, a film in the end. <laughs> this was trying to hybridize our model making to a, a computer graphics. So you can see it's a physical model, but there it's mapped uh, by the um, the um, basically computer uh, generated model. It's quite it just you get quite dizzy because it's kind of moving. We thought it was kind of cool, like a handheld. Uh, camera, but he really didn't. Have, he really didn't have patience to uh, finish the movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we lost. But, <laughs> but but as you know, it didn't even happen here. So. So now we, that was a kind of urban context, and then. <laughs> this is a big model. <laughs> um, which was quite nice because we didn't really know how to make the ETFE skin in the model very well, so we actually rendered it uh, like this. And those, like, uh, the Star Wars elements on the model is actually computer graphics. It's not made. <laughs> you can see people moving. This is basically the public datum where we thought we could just give it back, given that building is occupying the public uh, domain. Thank you. Okay, I think we will uh, now start into a general discussion. I have a few observations and comments, um, and I expect we will fold Sanford in to a later discussion when he arrives. Um, and then open it up. I'm sure there are people ready to jump in, but Maybe it's more some sort of set of general observations about the idea of, of how one <coughs> conceives of constructing a public or publics. Um, and 
in a certain sense, this issue of, I, I don't know, there's a certain theme of vacancy <laughs> that runs through the three, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. emptiness, like the emptiness of the American landscape, the vacant lots of the gardens, uh, the open spaces that you provide that other people then appropriate as they will. And so, on the one hand, the relationship, I guess, of, to a democratic public of the issue of vacancy or openness, but also the issue of access, which Ken started with, to maybe even trespass. <laughs> uh, you know, whether it's the skateboarders that are allowed to trespass or whether it's the... Uh, you know, appropriators of gar garden space, that it's a certain issue of how you appropriate and mark territory that is, you know, uh, you know, so the, this fine line, let's say, between access and appropriation or access and trespass. Um, and, and maybe this, uh, the issue which Shoy, you know, the idea that we now have biennials every two days mm. uh, is this kind of proliferation of activity and event and, and how you think about, you know, do we need to systematically unprogram things, right. uh, you know, as opposed to fill them up with activities? I guess, um, but I will allow your your general responses to one another. Um. I think there is a general fear. It's kind of ironical that in the landscape domain, in the nature domain, there is a fear of unprogrammed space, especially in an urban context. So. Park is extensively programmed. Uh, otherwise, it will consider to be kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, dangerous or Nuisance. it's going to be dead. Um, this fear, and on the contrary, architecture is more and more becoming more and more kind of unprogrammed. Uh, appreciation of unprogrammed space is emerging because I think partially because of nature and architecture, there is a kind of uh, attempt in merging the two, uh, like con like thinking of the uh, post, what is the next to, uh, mo what's after modernism, you know, a lot of architects are trying to uh, use nature as analogy of architecture, and which, of course, nature uh, implies that there is no extensively programmed uh, um, space. So I, I think that, uh, the paradox, or how do I say, like the landscape being over-programmed, architecture being less programmed, uh, which I think is a very interesting um, mm. uh, direction that I'm observing. Um, so one of the proposals that I was making in, in my work was that there was no such thing as unprogrammed space, mm. that vacant spaces were intentionally left vacant or they were left vacant by market um, by market forces because they weren't valuable enough to develop so that means they weren't valuable enough to invest in so certain communities there are vacant spaces where those the market and, and government and institutions aren't investing in them so I saw that as an as an act actually um, and then nature to me was a way into understanding spaces more broadly all kinds of produced and constructed spaces. It was the particular problematic because this, the topic was nature in that, in that moment. Um, but it's true that, that um, or it was my experience at well, as well that these vacant lot gardens were imagined as being unprogrammed and vacant. So the way we program them was we put a fence around them. Mm -hmm. And the way we put it, and what that does is it accomplishes respectability for the neighbors who get the, then gate out their unrespectable neighbors. Mm. So they're performing individual respectability and then community respectability because this is a respectable community that has mm. gardens, even though they're just tires and <laughs> lawn. Um, so, I, so the idea of openness is contested there because they're supposed to be open gardens, but they're gated. And the idea of emptiness and vacancy is then contested there. Yeah, it's, I, um, in some ways, I mean, what I said about James is not um, entirely predictive of what we're, we're talking about. But uh, among the ways in which uh, I think some of his ideas connect is, I mean, first of all, with the sense that um, uh, with commerce becoming the dominant value on the American scene, what was being proliferated was the possibility of waste or waste, uh, waste space. And, and so you get um, uh, either space in which sort of nothing is being, you know, quote unquote, nothing is being um, done or space that is highly, you know, um, um, 
undistinguished space, I guess is how he was. Um, uh, so the, the landscape was you know, uh, full and empty at the same time, that is to say, full of evidence of commerce um, uh, and the effects of commerce, but uh, empty of the things that might distinguish one space uh, one, one space for a num uh, f uh, from another. Um, and it's not that, in, in, in presenting here, I don't, I don't think you know, James has any sort of solutions to the kinds of, of, of problems that we're, we're, we're um, um, uh, discussing here. Uh, what is, I think, useful in um, bringing him up is how um, sort of rigorously he continues to think the problem of, of the democratic over and against sort of, you could say, the architectural or, or, the, or the distinguished. He felt, however, um, I think um, in a way that's different from the kind of problem that Walter uh, pointed out in the first instance, that the problem was always going to be, um, um, <clears throat> you could say, too much access, uh, the, too many people sort of coming in, that then the architecture would, the architect would have to sort of resolve, or that, that problem would have to be um, sort of solved by um, producing, um, you know, what were to be more than sort of compromises between access and distinction, or, or dis, dis, um, um, yeah, I guess access and distinction as such. Um, but I think the problem that we are describing now is one where, in which we, we think about distinguished public spaces, that access is so limited that it really is no longer a matter of, I mean, if you're thinking about public universities, do they represent the public in terms of what, what's happening, in, uh, happening inside? So um, we have public space that can be distinguished, but if we look at um, those represented w inside that space, they don't constitute or they don't reflect the socioeconomic reality of the public outside that, uh, in, in, in whose name the, uh, the edifice or, or the structure has been, uh, been constructed. So James was always, as a, in a sense, thinking that everybody was already sort of inside or getting inside. And the, the task was to uh, produce a pedagogic space, let's say, that could um, reconcile access with uh, distinction some, some forms of solitude um, um, uh, um, conducive to reflection, uh, and not just you know, not, not just the public event, not the not the performance, but the possibility that within the uh, with, within the multitude, one could also have moments for critical reflection on on the space, on um, you know on, on the structure and one's one's own activities within it. So yeah. I wonder also if that relates to, I mean, Christine's point about the issue that there's the performance, which is the thing, let's say, and there's the performance, which is all of the apparatus around the thing that it, you know, is outside of it or it needs to support itself. That how, how do you, how one orchestrates those other things beyond the focus of attention, but the network of relationships that is also needed to perform the object performance, let's say. So, um, I mean, I'm just wondering how the public gets engaged, like for example, like in the case of, is there, you know, between Christine's work in North Lawndale and the kinds of discussions and conversations that happened that ultimately instigated another set of players to come on the scene, and maybe this debate or discussion about the use of the lakefront by very conflicting publics about what that should be used for. I mean, how you stage those sort of, uh, or incorporate them into the work in some way, um, uh, whether as a, as a mm, you know, telling the story about it or whether as a, as a project that tries to convey those uh, disagree disagreements over the use of a particular site. You know, let's say it's not nature in the sense of being, uh, you know, it's clearly, a conceit, it's not, you know, as I think Christine says, the idea of the vacancy is clearly a decide to withdraw resources from it. It's a decision to be vacant, not vacant as wild, un untamed, but actually a conscious withdrawal. Um, but equally, the image of nature along the lakefront is also a conceit and a construct and blatantly not true. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like, how do you, I guess, stage for, you know, when people think of these things as fundamental truths that they are, um, you know, in conversation with nature, or that this is a, 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 a preordained right to open lakefront, which in fact is a 
is a construct in a certain way. I mean, basically, how do you use a project to, um, if not resolve, at least identify and stage those sorts of arguments over the use of that open, provisional openness, um, like when you're designing a project or coordinating one? Right. Well, I, um, I'm always looking at what the dominant discourses are, what, what ideas are being engaged or built. So if we were, and then how people are tactically maneuvering within those to complicate or to, to, to accomplish agendas that may or may not be part of the initial discourse or the initial agenda. So if we're thinking about I don't know, if we're thinking about, we'd have to think about the dominant discourse of, of the lakefront or the Lucas Museum or something like that. And the idea about it being, the, you know, conflicting it discourses about, I'm so talking outside what I've thought a lot about. But if we're talking about free and open forever, what is it, open, free, and clear, yeah. right? And then we've got a, a building that, uh, was, it, was it free to go into the building? Did we have, did, were they gonna charge? Probably. Probably. So then there's, you know, an immediate discourse there, you know, a t contradiction. Um, and so people, w then I would be like, if we want to tactically perform free, open, open, forever, open, free and clear, then we've got to make that building like you did to make space for the tailgating. But also then how can we then perform that value or that discourse um, other ways? But most of this is through, you did it structurally by moving it up. I think more about well, I think about how people actually move through space and then do temporary or programmatic um, solves, tactical solves, in order to reconcile conflicting discourses or make room for multiple discourses at the same time. You know, you know I think, I mean, I, I, mean, I take it that um, what's particularly acute or distinguished about architecture as a, as, as a practice, right, is that there's always the dynamic, or it, it highlights the dynamic between what it is that one wants to do with the structure or space, right? And on the other hand, all the things that someone might do with the space that you have, con and, and that there's no way that the first can um, effectively legislate mm -hmm. over the, the second, um, and that there must be some uh, um, um, you no know, attempt to allow for that possibility, but that the but the power would be the dynamic between the two. That is to say, that if you have a structure that uh, I mean, because it would be impossible to kind of imagine a structure that can only legisl that legislates everything or all uses that pertain to it, um, but a structure that simply gives itself over to all of the things that one might do would somehow lose any sort of distinctiveness. Uh, altogether, and and so I, I take it that that's the kind of ongoing dynamic that um, that all architecture uh, embodies. It strikes me that that's a perhaps distinct problem from you know the question of the use of the lakefront as such. Although they, I, I think they're they're related, because there I think the, the problem might be what constitutes or who who's actually in charge of something like the public trust. That is to say, if there's if the notion is that the lakefront exists as something like a Public trust, um, and I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, what's fa what's fascinating to me is uh, the the lack of clarity about the process by which one could ultimately determine, since there were so many conflicting views, um, um, who could determine whether this was going to be an exception to what the accepted understanding of, um, you know, the uh, the use of the uh, uh, park lands. Or and, and I guess we're seeing the same thing uh, in, in, uh, in play with the, uh, uh, the Obama Center um, mm -hmm. on, on, on the South Side, and um, and I I mean I I don't think that the um, well you know I I'll guess I'll just say I don't know how that gets uh, how, how that gets adjudicated, but it's a real question of you know who when we say that something exists as part of the public trust, what does that actually mean in practice in terms of who can say. Uh, you know, who actually legislates that in, in a, um, uh, in, in a, say, you know, consistent or at least a legible um, a way so that the decisions um, make a certain kind of sense. I mean, another, um, I guess another theme which I was interested in, the, this proliferation of creativity <laughs> um, and the proliferation of creative cities and the, and the monetization of creativity, let's say, and sort of how 
you know, how is it possible not to add to that monetization, but to sort of produce an, a shadow economy outside? I mean, how do you resist that trajectory? Or how do you deviate it uh, and not um, accelerate it? Or, you know, you know, what are your strategies <laughs> to deal with your frustrations or amb ambivalences about that sort of um, trajectory? Well, in my case, I was trying to say that um, you have to actively acknowledge the problem, but that actively participate to the creative economy. Otherwise, you'll be uh, left. Because, for example, the biennial, there is a world biennial forum, which is created in Amsterdam, which is a group of curators and artists who actually started to look at the global biennial uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, initiative, but there is no architect in that uh, forum. So I think we acknowledge the problem, but we have to constantly insert ourselves into those uh, you know, initiatives and try to participate and then kind of uh, contribute to um, better um, defining, to defining those events and experiences. Sort of to, to, to reconfigure the cookie cutter strategy of the cultural policies of cities as strategies of putting themselves on the map or as... Right, but also uh, I think in order for architect, well, to be part of that uh, initiative, architects need to gain um, uh, expertise that can propose also a soft, like a programmatic ideas, not just uh, physical ideas. And I think the, the soft power is very strong because of course you can actually uh, bring a lot of money and initiative together without a physical, uh, you know, uh, promise. And I think in that also domain, architects should be actively participating to be part of the programmatic, uh, um, you know, initiation process. And I think that's, that's what I was trying to say, not to just ridicule that uh, side, but actually to really be alarmed as an architect and also to participate in those um, discussions and initiatives. You know, I, I guess I take it that, um, you know, part of what um, drives and makes uh, prominent these various initiatives and the like is, uh, um, you know, what is now, I guess, a, a sort of a status quo assumption that the aggregation of funds publicly through increased taxation as such, right? So, th so that um, if we're going to have a distinguished art, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, a city distinguished by art, the presumption right now is that it is by mobilizing the donor community in conjunction with art producers and, and the like to come up with the events and the um, um, you know, edifices that sort of really count for producing distinctiveness, right? But that. Um, you could say, but part of what that then um, presumes is the uh, diminished capacity of the public simply to sort of tax that community to the extent that it, it ought to be, such that the kind of decision making about what a city ought to look like would indeed be part of, the, I mean, it would be more, direct, to get back to my other point, more directly part of the public trust, uh, rather than hoping that one can entice the, you know, the George Lucases of the world to see their vision, to propose their vision, to then see if they can get public support for that vision, but rather to have it such that, I mean, if, if one were thinking about what, what a taxation structure ought to look like um, in order to produce the capacity actually to underwrite truly public projects, that might be a different kind of thing, and it would put, um, you know, the, uh, you know, architects in a different relation to the city, so it's not pleasing George Lucas, right? It would be actually pleasing the people of the city of, of, of the city of Chicago through elected, duly elected representatives or commissions appointed by uh, those representatives for that for that purpose, and and so it might look a little bit uh, or make it might look a lot different, so that if there were a decision to be made about, um, you could say, producing an exception, if it's you know for the use of public lands that it actually would have come from and developed out of a, a long-term public discussion. That's not, um, uh, you know, one version of you've got to compete for uh, the Lucas Museum in the same way that you want to compete for Google or 
or, or Apple or, my, uh, or Microsoft mm -hmm. um, because of the presumed boon to the economy that it's generating, that you're actually um, um, bringing that process into a more um, democratic and robust uh, a structure of uh, you know, say financing or underwriting the public good. Uh, because I promised to turn this over to our, uh, the rest of our participants to throw challenges and comments and responses, I will take that opportunity to uh, invite you with our microphone. Redefining the public so that it uh, conscripts rather than meekly contradicts the private. When I think of all of these leftover spaces that we're able to occupy, whether they're farm gardens or uh, uh, the waterfront museum, uh, I think that's what you're referring to, that instead of just trying to fill in wherever we can, there needs to be a more aggressive assertion of the public. Um, um, uh, and and not, not simply making do with the leftovers. Uh, something that architecture can, can certain, certainly do. Um, I think the problem is that the public is not, the, the, that to, to configure, aggressively configure the public domain, we don't have the trust, uh, public trust to do that. So that the, we can also look at these empty spaces that everyone is referring to as free spaces. Uh, uncoopted that exist outside of market mandates or outside of political mandates, um, uh, and that makes them legitimate, right? Because they're not they're not part of a market mechanism and they're not uh, subject to a political um, influence. So there's a contradiction between wanting to do more than just fill in between the gaps and and, and actually aggressively stage the public in the way that we know architecture can. If you imagine the amphitheater that used to sit in the middle of this campus, that's an aggressive <laughs> staging of the public, right? But at the same time, the, the absence of trust um, uh, in the forces that would be required to do that staging, right? Where you have to come together politically or economically um, and I think it's an interesting um, contradiction uh, or a, a, a maybe an impasse that uh, one of you might have a response to. That was, was that clear enough as a, a proposition? Hey. <laughs> I mean, the Lucas Museum, I mean, how many people have seen Star Wars, right? That's a popular, that should have worked. Right, as a, as a way to configure aggressively the public domain, given it this raised platform. Yet the, 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 there wasn't trust at the point that whatever this you know, maniacal billionaire was imagining to, for himself to overcome the tailgating. And it's, it's, just, a, it's just an interesting, interesting contradiction that we know what we need to do. We don't have the means to do it. Um, and trying to imagine what those means would be. You thought that, uh, for example, conceiving that elevated park in our proposal yeah. was aggressive staging? Staging of the public. Mm -hmm. One that is, is you know, it's a, a way to reinvent, which I think is behind the symposium, and to think through a public in another way. So, it's, I mean, it's very simple, but just the act of elevating Right, up the public mm -hmm. domain, and putting a large number of people, completely free access, up, I don't know how many stories, 10 stories in here, uh, is an aggressive way of staging, uh, staging a new kind of public. And right. you would have thought, you would have hoped that that would overcome, you know, the, the wonders of tailgating. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't. It right. may, I mean, it, I, it didn't play out, so it's hard to say. I think still, though, if you were asked as an architect to do such a building, I think even if you, th of course, have a, you can consider that it's a little bit of a superficial and staged publicness, but I think that's why the ground level was liberated, which is free access, obviously, no 10-story traveling, and then another space, and the gallery itself was 
uh, kind of almost secondary to the project. And I think that was, in a way, our aggressive statement that uh, the degree of publicness can actually be the whole point of the Lucas Museum because the collection itself was not that interesting in the end. So um, uh, I understand your point, but uh, we, are, we are actually believing, even if it's considered a little bit superficial, I think always providing some level of public um, open-ended space in the building. That's why mm -hmm. I was trying to collect like those. Prada. Part of New York, or yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but I yes, it's always a kind of dilemma of yeah. how, how, like, how much do you deliver this kind of lip service of public publicness in the building? Thanks. So, actually, this is sort of follow up. I, I, when Bob and I were first started talking about this, uh, I think I remember this right. I was very, very keen insisting on the word public in there, and you were actually a little uh, not thrilled with the word public, trying to find <laughs> synonyms, and you were very, very keen that performance would be in there, and I, you know, coming out of a certain uh, literary theoretical tradition in which the performative has been, um, it's not just that it's been overused, it's not even underused, it's always been a force for evil. Um, I, I was nervous about that. So I'm thinking now that I was wrong. Not about the performative part, but about the public part. And <laughs> part in response to this, which is that I, I thought what you said about uh, the Star Wars and, and, and uh, Lucas being unable to do this, because everybody, so Star Wars has a huge audience. Um, but an audience, so what I was thinking about public, it was not about an audience. There's a way in which the minute, and it goes to the question of the sort of theatrical, and then come back to the last panel, the sort of question of after theatricality. There's a way in which the, the question works for the Lucas Museum as well. So it was, I thought what you did, I thought what you, well, I thought you did two things. One was that, so yeah, if you're going to like do pitch a filmmaker, the lesson is don't make a movie. Um, so insofar as you're pitching like, m you know, in part me this time, I totally count no poems, no novels. You know, what you actually want is the architecture. But the actual part of it was that, you had different audiences there. So the tailgating, those people, it's a public performance, but it's a public performance of guys who are going to a football game or people going to a football game. You have a certain vision of what the public is in which the public becomes a series of different kinds of audiences. And the question of, say, what we mean by a public university, which actually in theory should have nothing whatsoever to do with an audience, right? In theory, the public university is a kind of um, financial structure um, which requires not, as it were, a kind of more openness to lots of different kinds of people, but requires um, uh, uh, a political economy which not only doesn't exist, but which actually gets worse and worse. So just thinking about you know, Christine's presentation about North Lawndale and thinking about what all that was designed to do, and then just thinking about what North Lawndale is today and realizing how it, not, succeeded in no way whatsoever. But as I think the median income in North Lawndale, my phone tells me, is currently like $22,000 a year. So I guess the reason I'm nervous about the idea of public, and this is what I would ask you to speak to a little bit, is that now it seems to me that the invocation of the public has a kind of symbolic and problematically symbolic effect, in the sense that as we start to talk about the public uses of these spaces, we're actually talking about them being open to a certain class audience. And it can be different classes for different kinds of activities. But it's not, uh, it's not, and the reason it doesn't quite work, right, is because one thing we would mean by public, which is a state which could produce these and which would do them in the way Ken is saying in response to the democratic desires of the, of, of the citizens, that state does not exist. And, and, and the fact that that state does not exist turns our discussion of the public into a kind of either a sort of nostalgic uh, reminiscence of a fantasy that it once did exist or a kind of utopian hope that it once would exist. So the kind of symbolic role played by architecture, so it's, it's not that it's you know, trivial at all, but the symbolic role played by architecture does two things. On the one hand, it holds out the hope of something like a public. On the other hand, it sort of 
demonstrates and enacts the way in which what actually happens in these, in these buildings is that the public is turned into something like an audience. And instead of the rich, instead of the kind of, what do you want to say, embrace of the idea of a, of a political economy, of a, of a state that actually mobilized the public, we have instead a kind of series of ideological fantasies about what publics might be. And then we're left with something like the audience for Star Wars, or the audience for you know better movies than Star Wars, or the audience for you know any one of the sort of wonderful public institutions that we have. So I guess the problem I'm trying to point to and just ask you about, and ask all of you, but but it's interesting for me for the architects because obviously you can't help but do what you do in a certain way. Is the degree to which the kind of symbolic function of those buildings is a kind of, you know, masking or, or misreading of the material base which makes those buildings possible, but which makes another set of buildings impossible. Um, and that other set of impossible buildings would be the buildings that actually would represent a public architecture, which was not a kind of mask for what is essentially a kind of private architecture. So I'm looking at show. <laughs> I don't expect architects to, to solve this problem, but I just wonder if you, if this is a thing that you would worry about. Uh, well, it was a little bit too difficult for me to understand uh, your <laughs> highly articulate. Uh, if you uh, couldn't understand point. it, it wasn't that articulate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Um, well, I think, uh, well, are you saying that, can you actually repeat the question? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to repeat it like in about 15 words, though, which is that there's a way in which we, I'm thinking about our building, but thinking about architecture in general, you want it to do sort of two things. You want it to perform a certain function, and we also want it to symbolize mm -hmm. and to mean something, which is not exactly necessarily identical to what it performs. So we want, say, our building to perform a certain function for the campus and for the city, but we also want it to symbolize a relation to the city and to the public, to the public, which in the current political economy, our campus can't quite have. So the thing is, is that part of what we want, the symbolic function, actually looks less attractive the more you think about it, because it looks like really a kind of, you know, cover up for the actual function, which is to sort of mm. not disgraceful, but not actually part of the contribution to a, a truly public architecture and a truly public university, one which would be, in effect, open to everyone, around which there would be no fences. James's nightmare. And that, was that better? Maybe, 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 maybe well, Ken I hope uh, I hope you ask this question to two other participants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so but, uh, I, I didn't mean this was about OMA's practice. I know, but, uh, <laughs> it's not meant to your be personal. Question, your question actually start to, I, I have to, I feel like I have to start explaining the project that we <laughs> delivered yesterday. Yeah. So, but uh, yes, the public, symbolic publicness is, is, is a kind of similar discussion we just had. I think yeah, the symbolic publicness, why do you think that doesn't coincide with, uh, that can coexist with a true publicness? I don't understand. Yeah, so, I mean, even take our, our university. So what is the true publicness? So the true publicness would be a kind of reform of the political economy, which would take audiences and turn them into citizens. I mean, as a po I mean, you're basically saying that there's a symbol the symbolic dimension to architecture could be seen to produce this ideological veil over the reality. <laughs> Yeah. Unlike what it's actually performing as, and that that, but presumably the ideological veil c could also pr possibly produce this collective out of these self-interested audiences that are using a building or an institution for their own purposes. Presumably, it could produce an identity, a way in which disparate audiences identify with something and through that have a relationship to one another that they didn't have before. So I mean the question is, yeah, is there a kind of nostalgic Burnham-esque idea of the civic and the public that we all as assume is just a clearly so bankrupt that in fact it's clearly an ideological veil over the real operation of the institution or, 
or is this symbolic realm still important as a way to, to produce, to perform something and not just look like something? <laughs> You know, which I, I guess is the... I think the symbolicness can be provided not through architectural form, but actual place, a placemaking. And I think what, we, what I was trying to show was not really an iconic structure per se, but iconic placemaking. And I think for me, that is, as, as, as he said, it's a constant battle as an architect to actually, you know, uh, choose where you want to be at, um, from even from a landscape to a building. You know, not now I think we even have a chance to actually deliver nothing. And I think that's, but of course that's irresponsible in my opinion as an architect. So there are various ways to uh, participate and actually include, uh, to have true publicness, which I think is also being involved in programming itself as an architect. And I think that's, that's what I was trying to say, that it's not just form making, form delivering, not symbolic gestures, but also truly involved in pedagogical issues, actually programming, and also placemaking. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, to go, back to, to go back to the short story, the James short story, right? The, um, uh, the, the observation that Cockerell, the um, uh, um, jingoistic American makes with respect to the symbolic value of the buildings that he sees in DC is that that symbolic value is actually produced by his sense that they are enacting what democracy does, right? The, the people in black coats, just the everyday citizen in those buildings doing what they do and that, so there, for him there's a kind of identification between what he sees as the buildings representing and what is actually happening, which is the working of democracy, but the result is what he just calls a pile, that is to say, as, as he's just, it's, just a, it's a magnificent pile. But it works on his account because that pile corresponds to the actual democratic practices and what James, describes in uh, New York, in respect in his experiences in New York City Hall, is actually something a little bit more um, um, uh, complicated for a moment because he does think of the building as architecturally distinguished, but yet at the same time one that is doing some of the actual political work of democracy uh, that the building was um, intended to do, and, and he, you know, he finds himself sort of suddenly in the presence of the mayor doing the mayoral things inside this building with all the photo uh, paintings on the walls, um, you know, uh, looking down and giving their sort of blessing to what's 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 taking uh, taking place. But I, uh, but tellingly, in the American scene where that moment is presented it is with an air of nostalgia as well. That is to say that the city hall does not represent for James what this, you know, the larger city is actually representing, which is the triumph of a kind of commerce, but a kind of holding on uh, um, to, uh, of a, I mean, to an ideal that I don't think that James sees is, is um, uh, likely to prevail uh, you know, over the next, uh, I mean, he's right, over the next next several decades. So I do think that, you know, when you're right, that there is a sense of a kind of nostalgia attached to the possible, you know, the hope that these buildings can do um, um, something that even by the late 19th century they were no longer doing, which is to sort of enact the kind of identification between the symbolic distinctiveness of these structure, public structures and the, the act, their actual um, um, functioning in a, uh, you know, as truly public, uh, 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 public, public buildings. And what about when the, I mean, I, I guess this is it's an, an observation to some of the project that Sho, uh, Shohei showed, but also when the symbolism starts to become isomorphic with the contingent provisionality of that performance on the interior. Let's say when you hypothesize tent city, whether that's of a certain displaced version or the Art Basel version of that, I mean, when that kind of provisionality and temporality is then incorporated as the rhetorical symbolic dimension of the architecture in a way it's it's also showing what it's telling in a certain sense mm -hmm. or you know that that gap between its in other words it's not a aura of permanence and singularity and identity anymore it's some some other form of sim, you know it does the job but it also seems to be sim, you know representing or or articulating that lack of permanence or stability or identity, I guess. Mm -hmm. so, so part of the, uh, actually, I don't know if there's anyone else. 
those, you only get so much privilege. We need more microphones. You can mind. But, but, but part of the point there would be, just to think about the title again, is that the worry would be, and, and I think this is so not meant as a, a criticism of the architecture, but meant as a kind of bit of self-critique of our desire for the architecture, mm -hmm. which is that it is performing the public precisely because the public it's performing is a kind of nostalgic fantasy at this point. That is, we don't actually have an idea of what that public would be. And we substitute for that public a set of performances of which architecture is a very, you know, ver certain kinds of very high level architecture are a very, very powerful expression because they do give you what Bob's just describing the set. And they do give, I mean, you uh, one feels that if, you know, uh, Lucas had chosen you guys, they would at least have had a better argument against mm -hmm. the people who were protesting what the use was, but that while it could have won for that and kept that space open in a certain way, the fantasy that keeping that space open is somehow reproducing or reclaiming the idea of the public really is a kind of fantasy. You know, that, that, the, that the world that we live in, that political economy, it's not a public, it's to go back to the word was used before, it's a kind of audience instead. Mm -hmm. So it would have still appealed to that audience, but it wouldn't have managed to produce the kind of structure of a public that we don't have. And that architecture, and that my personal, for example, attachment to this project, and my intense emotional investment in making it come out right, is politically maybe not reprehensible, but it's politically, because that seems a little strong, but it's politically not exactly uh, progressive. In other words, it's a way of compensating for something that we don't have, rather than trying to figure out how to build the thing that we need. Hmm. So with that optimistic note. <laughs> yep. Where's Jason? Oh, there you go. You need to move the mics down and get over there. Back there. Try to switch gears a little bit here. Um, I think in all three threads, I heard that you know that there's a great value in architecture or architects telling their story, and show you told that a lot too near the end. Um, do you feel that for these public spaces, how we perceive them as just individuals and critique them, is because we're not hearing the story enough from the architects and the designers or the servants who create these spaces, or because um, we don't appreciate the value that they offer as well. You know, as many of you mentioned, they, they weren't in the conversation for the biennials, or they weren't in that conversation when someone was critiquing that space. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on what, we, what you perceive the value uh, of the architect is, or the designer, uh, by the public in, in today and what it should be going forward. Hmm. Um, again, I, uh, sorry, I don't really understand the question very well, but s so as an, as an architect, what the, the value of... What the, what the public perception is the value of, of the designer, and if they're not uh, perceiving that, in your opinion, or they are getting that value in general, to understand your, your process, your story, uh, the impact that you're trying to make. Well, we are assuming, I guess, we are not really, the public is not understanding our stories. Um, and I think, again, how Bilbao effect wa was quickly shifted after the crisis to a much more event-based um, investments and how the soft power is infiltrating, I think the architecture somehow neglected or architects somehow neglected the kind of the public desire and I think that uh, that's why the consequence of not being involved in that kind of new initiatives uh, and that's why I feel that uh, we as an architect need to um, insert ourselves much more into a kind of uh, um, those discussions and um, also alarm ourselves that uh, that that domain is uh, quite critical to be involved, and I think the storytelling part. I don't know. We we believe that uh, our uh, office 
is actually uh, very focused on storytelling. And I think, uh, as you saw, um, a lot of diagrams and a lot of uh, kind of bold um, graphics to really try to convey the story that uh, uh, that goes beyond, you know, client and architects. Or I think it, we are trying to tell the story to the larger audience. And I. Um, well, I think that's that's a, a very much necessary process uh, for our office, but I don't know if in general architects are trying to do that. I think in some cases uh, it's actually more strategic to avoid storytelling. So, um, so uh, it, it's hard to say as, as a kind of single uh, answer, but. Uh, you know, we are we as an OMA trying to actually engage ourselves uh, into uh, storytelling and not necessarily expecting an architectural outcome either. Just even involving in a programming and other uh, non-physical uh, um, efforts. I mean, uh, uh, I, mean I think it's interesting this idea of the conflation of the public and private, which goes to the, the, the contemporary circumstance of much development on campuses, ours included, and, and uh, um, uh, also Ken's. <laughs> um, you know, but the idea is, are we privatizing the public? Which is to say, is the public the Trojan horse for the development of the private? It has now been given that ideological cover of doing the public good. Mm -hmm. Or can we think about publicizing the private, which I think is a lot of what your your work and your office's work do also, which is to somehow leverage and piggyback a private develop a private client and open it up, crack it open to appropriation by different publics. It's almost right. the inverse of the you know private investment filtered through a public institution, uh, privatizing the public, but it's actually publicizing the private. When you I'm thinking of the early Prada stores, but other mm -hmm. projects also that basically take a what would be a commercial space and actually collectivize it in a certain sense mm -hmm. I mean I guess the the other the other thing is you know we might be criticizing audiences versus publics but in the world of, of this sort of atomized individualism I even uh, crave an audience <laughs> of more than one uh, it might be an accomplishment to just diffuse an audience around certain common uh, interests and principles today um, yeah, I think I think that's our job. I think our job as a campus, as a university, as a as is to tell this is to, if stories help us make sense of being in the world, and the stories we choose to tell are helping us to make sense of being in the world, then we want to choose the story. We want to say, as a public institution, we publicly want to tell the story that this is important. We think this is important. It's important to make spaces where people can make other stories to make sense of being in the world, and we need to make a bold st and it's fine. Making, we should make a bold statement about filled with ideology about where the thinking about architecture is right now and its relationship to the public and private so that s people can then respond to it or speak back to it over time. I think that it doesn't have to, it, it just has, to, its job is to tell the story that, um, tell the story that we understand right now and its public will come if that story feels truthful and if it feels authentic and if there's a way to, for them to access in it have find access into it and then start to remake and retell their stories within it. I know I'm being really abstract, but I feel like we have to stop worrying about, um, we have to just worry about making the space that we need to make opportunities for people on this campus to make work that's gonna interrogate what it means to be in the world today. Mm -hmm. And for us right now, that happens to be a place where people might make music, they might make theater, they might make art, they might share it, they might then, but but not, not just the public making it, people who spend their lives dedicated to figuring out how to make it and what questions we should be asked while we're making it, and then sharing that with people who are coming in to engage in that conversation with us. Hi, so I'm really interested in uh, the story of architecture um, and how architects tell stories. Um, but I don't think stories matter at all um, because I think architecture accumulates over time and we look backwards and figure out the story that was actually told. Um, part of that is that the public 
uses architecture in unexpected ways. Um, and I think part of that is also, uh, like OMA, my perception of that firm is one that you know, tells a very compelling story and often a best-selling story, but the book costs $20,000 and there's 200 people who read it. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious how you feel about, you know, I like the, uh, the skateboarding slides especially because mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm interested in like a sign that says, please skateboard. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, I don't know if that, if that enters your thinking in terms of the story you're telling now versus the story that will be told later on. Mm -hmm. And I think that applies from everything from CCTV to the Prada stores to the George Lucas thing, which seems like it should have just gone to like the Venturis or whatever, because that would be both what the public wants and you know the, the idiot funding it wants. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, I think that uh, we are not uh, truly believing that our stories actually continues for the rest of the building's life. I think we actually did a lot of research about post-occupancy uh, and how discovered how the, our buildings are in, used in an unintended uh, ways. So we, of course, enjoy actually that kind of moment. That's why I'm saying that this kind of unprogrammed space is actually more and more becoming attractive and the story we're telling is how we are actually citing or placing and resolving the program, resol you know, resolving and kind of trying to justify our moves just to uh, you know, convince the general audience and public and the client. But that doesn't mean that we are defining the story that happens within the building. Um, and I agree with the, the comment that in the end, the program actually generates, as long, as long as there's a program that can generate contents and generate uh, uh, education and, uh, um, you know, not just consuming program, like a commercial program, I think there's always a chance that uh, that, that building actually uh, generates its own story. And I think, um, uh, I, I think referring to like CCTV and product, it's a kind of, uh, you know, often a criticism that we get that uh, we kind of participate to uh, uh, a brand or such a kind of big kind of uh, um, entity like CCTV and still talk about a publicness as a kind of lip service. But again, uh, we, when we are designing, we are not just truly embracing that as a kind of true narrative. It's just a kind of part of the narrative that uh, enriches the space and the use, and trying to actually open up the new new story, uh, the potential to actually uh, conceive a new story within, even though that's a, our story in initially. But I think we are always uh, trying to, you know, have this um, room for uh, new stories to come. By the way, the, the skateboarding, that was just uh, no skateboarding until the photography was done. <laughs> after that, <laughs> after that, that was open as a space where it, actually that's regular uh, skateboarders now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was I just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, that was the kind of first day. Literally the moment that we finished, yeah. they started skateboarding, so the photography was not even done. That's why we put that. But now it's open, so you're <laughs> welcome to <laughs> escape. escape. Yeah. All right. uh, and just thinking about the kind of different attitudes towards uh, storytelling and whether it's about kind of uh, describing the ambitions for a project or um, kind of telling people how to use it. Uh, Christine, you talked about the, the gardens. And the impression I got was that they might have gone unused if not for the kind of deeply condescending story about how they should be used. So could you see uh, the kind of storytelling that goes into like presenting uh, a public building as a kind of uh, instigation rather than a kind of truthful statement about how you see it being used, but a kind of a way to kind of instigate all of the uses that you might not have thought of? So the reason the gardens weren't successful is because they were imported. Um, they weren't asked for by the gardeners. 
but the gardeners had very little resources, so they tactically took them up. So that would be the you know a building that's given to somebody that um, wasn't wasn't authentic, wasn't from them, wasn't meaningful, didn't feel truthful somehow. But they tactically maneuvered within the, that space um, in order to accomplish something. In this case, perform identity, uh, perform respectability to themselves and others. So to me, a, tr uh, uh, a successful story, a successful garden, a successful building, an authentic one, would have been one that um, would have, um, well, they were successful for the gardeners because it did perform respectability for them and it performed respectability for the community. Ultimately, it wasn't enough, but it actually did bring a Starbucks into the community and some other things and the mayor and they got the potholes fixed and Holman Square built the development and everything. So it was successful to some extent, but um, a story that, um, what was your question again? What was the first part of your question? Uh, I guess, could you use the story uh, rather than as a kind of prescription, but as like an so, investigation? Yes, so I, I don't know how we can avoid that. I mean, truthfully, I don't know how, I think we can only tell, tell the stories we know right now from ourselves, and we can listen to other people's stories, but the, the trouble with the open land, or the challenge, the cha open lands wanted to accomplish something specific. They wanted to get more people to build their community capacity in order to, um, they had a very specific agenda that they wanted to see happen. That space couldn't do that because they weren't, um, they weren't, um, they weren't taking, they didn't know the people, they didn't know the community well enough that they were working with. And um, their objectives were different from the objectives of the people that they were working with. If we can think of a, find a space, find a story that is actually matching the objectives of at least the primary users, if not starting to, to match the needs, the authentic needs of ex users extended beyond the primary users, like the rest of the people on campus, then that might be a, a, a space that doesn't have um, an objective imposed on it and might be more successful. I don't know if I answered your question. It's a, sto it's a story based on the stories that are coming, coming up from the people who want to use it. Quick, 30 second question. 10 seconds from microphone delivery. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering more so for Kenneth and Christine, where you think the role of the architect falls necessarily in this kind of triangle dance between the desire of what OMA is trying to create versus the desire of the public and the people who are funding it versus the people who are actually going to be functioning in this space on the daily who I think are largely underestimated for as two people that are coming to the conversation outside of the architecture field but still within the UIC realm. What do you think the role of the architect should be in designing this space for the people you guys are talking about? Because I think there's a lot of outside influences that Christine brought up earlier, specifically in the North Lawndale project. You talked a lot about how the outside influence did influence the garden. So where do you think that reflects itself in this conversation? Well, I'm hugely excited. Um, so as a director, what I do is I have a big idea, a story I want to tell. I assemble a team of people who know more than me about their different areas of interest. We decide on the common th truth that we're exploring, and then I count on them to help me imagine it even better than I could before. So I think I'm counting on the architects to, um, uh, to become part of the team to uh, listen for what we want to accomplish and help us to accomplish it in ways we may probably have not even imagined yet. I have no idea how space and how built spaces, I mean, I have some idea because I live in them, but I don't have nearly as much idea as you do who spent your whole life thinking about this, how spaces can support mm -hmm. um, people thinking about certain things, people making certain things in a certain way, people interacting with other people in a certain way. So I'm, I have nothing but excitement and um, ambition about leaning on and learning from the architects and being inspired by them in conversation with us about what we think we want to do, no, what we know we want to do, what we have to do. But I think that typically when we engage in this kind of project that uh, we will go through extensive 
programming and discussion with different different stakeholders such as student and users and uh, faculty etc so it's I think I hope and I think that part of the process is that uh, although it's a competition even after a uh, winner is announced I think that winner will go through a certain level of uh, um, let's say um, discussions with the stakeholders I guess and our ambition is more than just making our work within the space our ambition quite literally directly is to perform the value of making and the arts on campus and in this area and the city yeah. so that that's going to help us in the long term as well and and there's you you are suited like no one else to accomplish that the architects in the room well i guess i mean i suppose the difficulty is that um um, if one were to imagine the, the conversation that we're talking about um, at, on the University of Chicago campus, right? I, I, I take it it would be largely the same with respect to trying to get the story of the architects making broad claims about what it is we want to do and c making a decision based on what we think the University of Chicago wants to do, how it wants to relate to the neighborhoods and uh, the city, the city at, um, uh, as a whole. But I, t I take it the force of the debate here is what role, what is the distinction that the term public would have in that kind of discussion? And I, I think it's hard to see what it would look, what, how that difference might manifest, right? So that, you know, private elite institution like the University of Chicago making decisions about a new building going up and how that's going to affect its relationships with the neighborhood. Is that public? It would be, it would, it would be hard to see how the story or the telling would differ significantly thinking about the University of Chicago over and against the University of Illinois at Chicago. And I think that's where, what we've been wrestling here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what work does that, I mean, because of course, you know, we want impact, we want all the public good, but it's all, you know, it's all for this um, behemoth on the south side, right? That's uh, producing all kinds of uh, wealth for its, you know, uh, wealth for itself. But I suspect that the debate or the discussion would sound you know, very much the same there but as isn't it does it here. And the question then is, yeah, then what does count as public? And that, I don't have an answer to that, but I think that's the problem we're, we're wrestling with, right? Because I don't think architecture can truly distinguish those two differences. I think the work that comes out of those two architecture will be different. I guess that's the... I think it comes down to the users and the objectives of the, of the users, as, I mean, as much or more than than the architecture and the idea that, I mean, I also take issue with the, the distinction between public and private in that we should have public art and private art, I think, or that this is public art making or private art making. I think that at, at the city's level one research university, we should be able to have private, we should have, be able to have artists make art and that we should have public access to public education about art, mm -hmm. and it and that to me is mm -hmm. the biggest, most important part of the public aspect of this, yeah. is that it's not too expensive, and you do have access to the highest level of instruction and, and thinking in the field here at UIC. Uh, I'm going to temporarily stop the discussion that we will continue after lunch, but first of all, uh, thank Ken and Christine and Cho for the first round. Thank you.